afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this community conversation. I'm Scott Cook, CEO for the Longmont Chamber of Commerce. On behalf of the Chamber and our partners on this project, the Longmont Leader and Longmont Public Media, welcome. Our nation is again grappling with racial tension. It seems this tension feels all too familiar to us, and that can lead us to the question of what to do next or what the right path forward is. The Chamber as a business organization does not normally take up issues such as this. In our advocacy work, we concentrate on business issues. However, business is about people. And at the Longmont Chamber, we believe opening and operating a business is, is for anyone that wants to pursue that dream. While again, we as individuals may not know what we can do to help save, solve our nation's problems, I would like to remind all of us that we each have an important role to play in our own community. To help, you, to help you with that, you will hear today from our speakers, their stories and their experiences. This will give you some background information. And then we've asked both of them to give us a couple of ideas on how we can build Longmont together. When we talk about diversity in our community, that can mean a lot of things. And there are many people that we could invite this afternoon. Today's conversation is a part of what we hope is an ongoing conversation that will include all the aspects of our diverse community. If you enjoy the event today and would like to see more like this, please let us know. Your feedback is very welcome. A note on the questions. In our conversation, you will hear questions that were asked earlier, questions from our partner, the Longmont Leader, and your own questions. To ask a question, you will see an Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. Click on the button and enter your question. You can also use the chat section as well, but it'll be easy, easier for us to spot your questions using the question feature. Macy May from the Longmont Leader will be moderating the questions. Our goal today is to have a productive conversation that moves our community forward by recognizing what we've done correctly and those things which we still need to work on. Difficult questions are welcome. Our speakers are prepared for them, so please ask them. Questions, though, that include profanity or are in any way harassing towards our speakers or anyone else in the audience will not be tolerated and will not be read by Macy, our question moderators. <clears throat> Attendees can and will be removed if, it, if that is needed. Again, questions are welcome, even the difficult ones. I will now turn it over to Liz Smokowski, CEO of the Longmont Humane Society. Liz has worked with nonprofits in Longmont for over 15 years. She is a past chamber board director and believes that diversity and inclusion is essential, are essential elements to the building of our community. Liz will then introduce our speakers. Liz. Thank you, Scott. I'm honored to have been asked to moderate today. This is an important time and an opportunity for change to take place. We have two leaders with us today that have played and will continue to play a key role in making change happen. Ms. Glenda Robinson is a longtime resident of Longmont. In the early 1980s, she founded an award-winning maintenance facilities company. Ms. Robinson is a graduate of California State University in Long Beach with a BS degree in criminal justice and a graduate of Leadership America. At the height of the civil rights movement, Ms. Robinson was an impressionable young junior at Memphis State University. While there, she became an active participant in the movement led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. just prior to his assassination in 1968. That involvement set her on a course to keep the King dream alive. She's worked tirelessly to make a difference through special events, workshops, group meetings, lectures, and the like all with the goal to simply make a difference. The Longmont Mayor and City Council issued a proclamation celebrating Ms. Robinson as the founder of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s week-long celebration that acknowledges her work and commitment to maintaining the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Ms. Robinson is an ordained minister and a mentor to many. Her heart's desire is to work to spread the gospel of love and build people as we create community. Joining her, living in Longmont since 1978, Public Safety Chief Mike Butler has over 30 years of comprehensive policing experience ranging from beat officer to police chief with nationally recognized police departments. 
Since 1993, Mike has been at the helm of the Longmont Police Department. In 2008, Mr. Butler assumed responsibilities for the Longmont Fire Department as well. During his tenure, the Longmont Police Department was chosen as one of the top 10 community policing departments in the nation by the United States Department of Justice. He has assisted in or taken a primary role in the development of several innovative management systems and programs. Welcome to you both. Ms. Glenda, in our earlier conversations this week, you shared with us some of the history of what has taken place. To start off today, can you give us a brief history lesson? Brief? <laughs> uh, sure, I'd be honored to do that. I, uh, I actually will s just share a, a small portion and then later when we come back, I'll continue. First of all, I'd like to say thank you, Scott, and your team, all these partners for putting together this conversation. Everybody is talking about having a conversation these days, and that's what they want to do. And so thank the Longmont Chamber and your partners for tackling such a complex task at hand, <laughs> though I see it also as a matter of heart. You all know that I always come from the place of valuing people, matters of the heart. Um, and small business is the economic engine of this country, is and always will be. And so we did, you deserve to be applauded and supported for carrying on this. Um, we're in the business of business, but really we're in the business of people. And so uh, thank you for starting the conversation. I think I will do a couple of things right here, right now, and then I will, I'll break. And then I'll run you through history on the, the next go around. How's that? Okay. I want to do two things. I want to define Racism. We have a, I just told Mike, we got a big topic here that we're tackling here. Race, policing, <laughs> and all of that with racism. But I want to define racism. Racism is the conscious or unconscious belief in the superiority of one race over and against another race. And it's manifested in the use of power or influence or resources or even communication that seeks to reject or marginalize or even oppress a person of another ethnicity. The other words that are being thrown around are sy systemic racism. I've heard people say systematic racism. No, it's systemic racism. And that talks about racism being embedded in the structures of society, whether economic or political or legal, medical, housing, or employment. It's a part of the policies and procedures of how a system operates, the systemic racism. And so on the next go round, I'll start and talk about slavery and how we got here in 1619 and try to run through, through history. Why don't you just go ahead and, and do that now? I think it would, it would set the stage and really give us some good foundation for this conversation. Okay, so I'll give you another definition. <laughs> Slavery. Slavery is a legal system that represses or has repressed a group of people because, simply because of the color of their skin. But that system somehow got embedded in every structure of the society and still lives and thrives in our system today. This is kind of why we're all seeing this uprising and this tension and this, all of these things um, surrounding what we're looking at. In fact, one of the things we, we were talking about was policing and police brutality is a national epidemic for us. All of our eyes have literally witnessed people being gunned down or shot down or choked. I myself am the result, or at least my family, 
I am the result of a nephew in 1981 who was stopped for speeding on the streets of Signal Hill, California. And two hours later, he was a senior running back at Long Beach State. Nobody knew that. He was driving a brand new GR7. Nobody knew that. They accused him of stealing that. But he ended up two hours later losing his life to that. And so I know the side of, of families having to deal with um, just with the loss of a person, first of all. Then he was accused of committing suicide, which his mother said, no, we know that that's not accurate, that that could not happen. It took five years. My family went through trials, uh, uh, grand jury investigations, exhuming his body, testing everything, five years to prove that he didn't com commit suicide or do any of the things that he was accused of. Um, after that, my family, I would say my, this would be my sister, who out of all nine of us, she was the only one that only had one child. That was her only child. Um, so after that was over, Johnny Cochran represented the family. And I don't want to use the word one because nothing on this earth can bring Ron Settles back. My sister was, had invested a lot in this life. She died in 1988. So trial ended in 85. They got paid or whatever it was. And she kept saying, this is not about any money. But they did sue the city of Signal Hill. They won. She died of a broken heart, I'm sure. So, so I know firsthand the loss of, of what it's like in, in sitting in trial and sitting in church at a funeral of such a vibrant life and such a vibrant body. Um, he, he would be 61 years old today. And he was my buddy. We were, we were good friends. He babysat my daughter uh, for me as we were transitioning to move to Colorado in 1980. So I had a great relationship with him. He was a great young man. And um, so that's the part of that that I know and the, the, the police brutality that we're even talking about and even witnessing. I also had the opportunity early on to meet Mike and see a whole different side. Well, my degree is in criminal justice, so I'm, I mean, I, I've known that side, and, and I've worked that side. Um, so I know there are good cops and bad cops, and I know that uh, it's, it's a hard issue. I, I, I just keep going back to that. And as a preacher, and I know y'all don't want me to start preaching up in here today, but the Bible says uh, that, that we're to love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Do we love ourselves? I mean, that to me, that would be the issue. That's that heart issue. And so everybody needs to examine themselves and, and decide what does it take for me to get these channels clear and love somebody. So or love myself, and then, only then, can I love somebody. So it's a, it's a, do, and we also talked about this. Everybody's complicated this, this word, this little four-letter word called love. It's simple. Be kind to another person. Treat others like you want to be treated. That's the motto of the United States of America. Do unto others as you would... Have them do unto you. What's so complicated about that? And so at, there is a point that you, we have to decide within ourselves. What can I do to manifest that love? Dr. King said, darkness can't drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate can't drive out hate. Only love can do that. The answer is love, and, and we've so complicated it. We gotta simplify it and take it back to its simplest 
form. So I can stop there or I can start with 1619 if you want me to. Why don't you start with 1619? Sure. Uh, oh, no. He's an understanding man. Oh, my goodness. So slavery, I, I defined it for you. And, and of course, uh, again, I'll, I'll just say it again. It's a legal system that repressed or represses a group of people because of the color of their skin. And that system is embedded in every structure of society even today. So, in 1619, the first African, Africans, enslaved Africans, arrived on American soil against their will to provide free labor to white landowners. American found, founders, founding fathers, met in the late 1700s, forming a constitutional convention to establish uh, the United States of America, which we're saying was established in, on July 4th, 1776. The Declaration of Independence was then drafted, saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that are among these, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I'm sorry to report to you, this is not every man's reality. Now, well, since then, we've been arguing over what it constitutes to be a man. And so African Americans were not even considered man. Some of them were uh, considered three-fifths of a man. Thus the problem we had now, which, jumping forward to the civil rights movement, you all have all seen these signs that simply say, I am a man. That, while that was pertinent to those garbage workers, which is what the that whole strike was about in 1968, me marching right down the street with my sign saying, uh, honor king, honor king, no, uh, something about justice. Um, it will come to me in a minute. Honor, oh, honor king and racism. I'm carrying this sign and I'm watching these men who are being treated less than human. By the way, I'm gonna segue to that that picture of me in that march uh, is at the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, and, and I knew that then, but this past summer I was in Washington, D.C. And I came up the escalator and my daughter, who lives in Atlanta, says, Mom, with all the work you've been doing in Longmont, Boulder, CU, Front Range, all that, don't you think you're in this museum? And I said, honey, child, not a chance. We come up the escalator and she goes, there's that picture right there. So, Frederick Douglass is right up here. The civil rights picture with me carrying this sign saying I was a 19-year-old junior at Memphis State, Honor King in racism, um, is right there, and below that is Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> okay, so I decided I'm in pretty good company. <laughs> so, that, but to me, it's heartwarming to have been able to make history there. I mean, when, doing this work, it's not easy work. Freedom isn't free. I know plenty of people who died uh, for these rights that all of us enjoy because all of our lives changed at the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and at the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And I'm going to run through that quickly or do you want me to stop? Why don't we um, move over to Mike okay. and have him share with us a little bit about your experiences um, through history with policing. All right, well, first of all, I, I am honored to be at the same table as um, Pastor Glenda Robinson. We've known each other for a long, long time, and uh, I have great respect for her, and I do appreciate this history lesson, and I am very, very respectful, and I honor your own personal history as you talked about that. 
Glenda. It's, it's quite moving and quite touching. I also want to thank the Chamber of Commerce, the Longmont Leader, and the Longmont Public Media for uh, organizing this event. It's, a, it's an important event, and I couldn't agree more that these discussions need to happen. Um, and I'm part of being, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be part of the initial discussion that we're having. I also believe that we need to try to figure out how to define the kind of future that we want to all live into and what we want to inhabit. And I think Glenda was getting into some of that as well, and I think she and I in our own personal conversations have talked a little bit about that. But I've been involved in um, some level of policing uh, for a few decades. Um, it's actually over 40 years, um, not, not over 30, it's over 40 years. And um, you're right in terms of the, the December of 1993, I became the police chief here in Longmont. And then some month in 2008, I became the public safety chief, which oversees police, fire, uh, a couple of other divisions. And we have a relatively new division called the Division of Community Health and Resiliency, uh, which has um, case managers, clinicians, um, uh, paramedics, police officers, and people who can actually help people in the community who are struggling with uh, their mental health and addiction. So my history with policing, um, that's kind of a personal uh, kind of resume that I'm just going to stop there and talking about that. But I think one of the things that we're all talking about in this country uh, in terms of the role for policing in our communities is something, it's a very, very valuable conversation that we need to have. What should police be doing in our community? And I can tell you, uh, for years, police chiefs would go out into their communities and say, if you need us, call us for anything. Well, basically, communities took police departments and police chiefs up on that, to the point where a large, large percentage of our calls for service don't have a crime attached to them. And so we got saddled with a lot of particular issues over the years um, and I don't think that's necessarily been good for the police and I know it hasn't been good for the community. And along with that what we've done is that we have criminalized a lot of human behavior over the years and again saddled police with by mandating that they go out and invoke the criminal justice system. and. That is not a good way to do business either with these social and health issues. The big one that we can all look at that happened over decades is the war on drugs. The war on drugs um, was a devastating um, set of circumstances for our country, uh, and most particularly for people of color. Um, and if you want to talk about disparate impact within our criminal justice system, a lot of it, it has the source the source is this war on drugs. And so this war on drugs uh, basically assisted in enlarging police departments all over the country. And it also helped develop a large, very large prison apparatus in this country. And many people know that the United States imprisons more pe people per capita than any other country, any other developed country in the world. And that disparate impact in terms of people of color is alive and well there. And so the conversation, I think, needs to really head towards, well, what is the appropriate role for police in our communities? And, and we in Longmont have done a lot of work in terms of making significant adjustments to trying to find that more appropriate role here in our community. And I don't know how much time we'll have to talk about that, but. One of the things that we need to do, you're hearing about uh, police reform, hearing about criminal justice system reform. I think we can go back a little bit further and talk about how do we reform the way we think about certain kinds of human behavior. And we need to reform this whole notion that we need to criminalize it. And I'm a big advocate that we do need to stop doing that. That there are other mechanisms and structures and ways of doing business that are much, much more effective, uh, much less polarizing, uh, and would actually uh, become, I think, a way of doing business that could really serve our communities. 
And so there are things that we've done in our community with Longmont Police that have, we believe, modeled that way of doing business. Uh, we arrest fewer people than we've done in the past. We've summoned fewer people. We've used systems and processes and programs like restorative justice. Uh, we have referred over 6,000 people that we could have arrested and could have ended up in some serious trouble within the criminal justice system. Instead of doing that, we referred them to restorative justice. We started programs like the Angel Initiative. If you're struggling with an addiction, come on down to the police department and we'll help you find a treatment provider. We have access to over 100 different addiction treatment service providers. Um, and we've leveraged literally millions of dollars in free treatment. Our community is no longer a community in, in that if you're struggling with a chemical substance addiction, that you can't get treatment. Now I know there's a little cognitive dissonance in saying, I need to go to the police department to try to work on my addiction, but you can do that. And over 250 people in this community have done that. And everybody that has walked through our doors, we have found them treatment. And in some cases, they possessed either narcotics, illicit narcotics, or paraphernalia. We're not interested in that, we'll destroy that. But we're, we're interested in, in helping you as a human being find another path. We've started programs like CORE, which is short for a co-responder program. People struggling with their mental health. Uh, what we can do, and if they commit a crime, we are, we are arresting fewer and fewer and fewer of those folks and helping them find services in a way that, again, can help them find a different path. And then there's a program called LEAD, the Law Enforcement Addiction Assistance Diversion Program. In essence, it does the same thing for people struggling with addiction. It uses a harm reduction model to help people find another path and their services. And I, I will tell you, some level, you heard the phrase, the proof is in the pudding. We are seeing fewer people uh, along these lines than we've ever seen in the past. We're seeing fewer suicide attempts, fewer suicides. We've, we've, we've encountered people that we've, we've worked with that over, you know, approaching a thousand different contacts, dozens of visits to the emergency department, have basically been trespassed from everywhere. And the only organization in this community that was assisting them was Longmont Public Safety. And we have story after story after story of people who have, we've helped take another path. And, and so this doesn't just deal with race, it also deals for us with uh, people who are struggling in a lot of different ways. And so, and so including our folks who are experiencing homelessness. So I just, I'll stop there in terms of talking about uh, what we're doing here in Longmont. But let me just say this about policing in this country. There's some history that's rather disturbing to many of us in policing in terms of what's happened over the years and decades with the policing profession. And we've been saying in Longmont for a long time that we need to figure out how to recalibrate, reset, rethink, the words now are reimagine what police can be doing in our communities, what we should be doing. And we want to be able to do that with the voice of our community as well. And over the years that I've been in Longmont, that's exactly what we did. The voice of the community basically guided what we did and how we did it. And so our entire policing profession needs to be thinking that way in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing it, what kind of services we're providing, and at some level, being able to share, partner, and collaborate more with other entities within our, any one community in terms of addressing a lot of the issues. And I'm convinced that our elected officials um, at all levels need to also take another look at how they're dealing with social and health issues. The passing of a law, the stiffening of a penalty as if those will serve as an insurance policy that's gonna protect us from the human condition doesn't work. And we have to come up with an entirely new ways of seeing how we're going to do this work. And when they do that, one of the things that I know that happened is whenever they passed a law or stiffened the penalty, they expected their local police department to go down and start enforcing those laws. 
And so we would go into communities and neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods where there are economically disadvantaged people or socially marginalized people, and have to enforce the law. Oftentimes, there's neighborhoods in any community that have the financial wherewithal or health insurance or options to deal with what's going on with somebody perhaps in their family or a neighbor uh, with a health or social issue, and they don't need basically to call the police or invoke the criminal justice system. Unfortunately, there are some neighborhoods where folks don't have options. And so at some level we've been, and I don't want to make any excuses here, but we've been forced to go into neighborhoods where people don't have. And we've still become the arm of, of government that's enforcing these laws. Well, guess who that puts us in connect, contact with? It puts us in contact with people who are economically disadvantaged, who are socially marginalized, potentially people of color. And that is the wrong way to do business. So as we talk about reform, reforming police, reforming the criminal justice system, we also have to think about how we're going to move forward with how we're dealing with certain human behaviors that for decades all we did was criminalize. And again, the example being the war on drugs. Anybody, any, anytime someone says, we want to declare war on something that's domestic, whether it's a social issue, health issue, I know what's going to happen. That's going to go south on us. That's not going to work. We have to figure out how to see people differently. And so whether you're struggling with an addiction, whether you're struggling with your mental health, whether you're struggling with homelessness, struggling with poverty, we need to take another approach. And we need to stop looking at people as a problem to be solved. We need to stop looking at people through the lens of their deficiencies. We need to see people differently. We need to see people in terms of, and I, will, and I thought Glenda said it so well, in terms of, the, the God that resides within them. And, and we need to see that they do have potential. They do have possibilities. They do want to be appreciated and valued. And that's the approach we've taken in long run, uh, in terms of saying we value you enough to spend time with you, to the point where we're getting information back from people in our community who will say the only friend I have is a police officer because they have spent time with me. They've helped me find treatment. They've helped me find a support system. They've guided me down this path. That's what police can do. And I'll just end with this in terms of a possible future for police. You know, if we looked at our community and said it's made up of the social fabric, and what police can do, how do you strengthen the social fabric? What police can do is help, we can help mend the social fabric. We can help strengthen that social fabric and we can help build that and enlarge that social fabric. Some of you know in this room and some of you know who are watching this that a very good friend of mine, Dan Benavides, and I walked over 200 neighborhoods in this community. And we mostly walked apartment complexes and we mostly walked mobile home parks and for the last two years, almost two years, we walked amongst exclusively Latino neighborhoods because we knew Latino people in our community had this sense of fear. Were they going to get deported? Were they going to feel, could they be safe in accessing government services, police services? Could they feel like they belong to this community? Our whole purpose in walking these neighborhoods was to encourage people to feel and believe they belonged. And then we would make an invitation to them to become more engaged in our, in our community. And it's amazing how many people want to get engaged. And one of the things that we discovered in these walks, we met over 3,000 people, um, was that people have gifts, they have talents, they have skills, they have expertise and resources. A lot of people don't know. The other thing that we found out was that not only do they have these gifts, they want to be able to offer these gifts. And then, and then what they didn't know, though, was how to do that. And I think we need to get really good in our community, and I would make the case in any community, that that kind of social capital exists in abundance, that there is an abundance of 
gifts, talents, and skills in any one community. And as we move forward in terms of trying to deal with particular health and social issues, that we have to somehow make a place for the, peop for the gifts of people in this community to be a part of uh, helping move this community forward. So I could say a lot more about this, but I'll leave it at that and we'll get into some other issues. But I, again, I am just honored to be here with Linda. For our audience, before we go any further, we are having video issues, so we want to make you aware that this will be available on Longmont Public Media's YouTube channel to view at a later time. Thank you. Thank you again to both of you. Clearly, such things, such as racism and bias, are in the forefront of so many people's minds. Glenda, as you said, we're seeing it on the news every day uh, currently. Share with us what are your thoughts about what's going on right now? And look at that smile. She's got a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't let me finish my history lesson, but it, it, it's okay. I'll, I'll walk down through it. And feel free to back up. Well, I, I wanted to go back to the Civil War. The war, of, of, uh, the war between the states and and what it was fought over, and we're even arguing over that. People are saying it wasn't fought over slavery. Um, the reason I wanted to go back there is because my history is long and personal. My grandfather, Murtis Sylvester Strong, was born in 1860. In 1865, due to the Emancipation Proclamation, he became a citizen. Uh, fast forward till he became a young man. Um, he helped found the AME Church back in my hometown in, in Tennessee. And uh, so between the AME Church and a group of white men came and took him, physically took him, with them to college. He got his college degree and he became the professor, if you will, of the town. You know, he was a teacher. Um, and that was an honorable per profession, especially for black people. And so um, there are things about him. I never got to meet him because he died in a 1946, and I was born later than that. Uh, but my, my folks kept him alive because of the just what we were talking about, the valuable work he did. And I'm always bragging about what you and Dan have been doing too in your neighborhood. So people will be contacting you about that and about a couple of other things, initiatives that, that you've done. I, this is what we gotta do. We gotta go outside the box. We can't just focus on hate and we can't just say, it's easy to do. We can't just look and say, um, oh, there are no black people in my, my neighborhood and I don't even know any and so it ends there. We gotta come outside of ourselves and make it uh, a pledge or a decision. I'm gonna meet a person not of my own race. I'm going to get involved and interact with someone who's different than me. So that I, I really wanted to go through that because you know the Civil War was 1861 to 1865. The the North won. Uh, <laughs> People seem to have forgotten that, but uh, I was proud of my grandfather and the legacy that he left in just doing good to people. He just always valued people. And so uh, everybody still talks about Professor Strong. My brother is now known as Professor Strong. He's 89, and I'm sure he's watching from Memphis. You guys were talking about people watching from Nebraska. I think my brother and my sister are watching from Memphis. But anyhow, just wanted to kind of go back to that. A lot of bad things happened, and a lot of good things happened during the, the Civil War. Fast forward, Reconstruction period, yay! People, black folks went to Congress and they were elected to key positions and, and they served Congress and communities uh, were well established and were able to uh, be self-sustaining and, and all of that. And now enters this racist system of Jim Crow. 
Not even a person. <laughs> Everybody say, who is Jim Crow? It's a system designed. Well, their main tag was separate but equal. If anybody knows anything about those restrooms, if you ever had a chance to drive through the South and see colored, white, water fountains, toilets, everything, Rest, restaurants or hamburger stands, front, front window, white, back window, colored. Anyhow, so those were things, and I can say this because this is how I grew up in this, and I, I was like, I couldn't figure out what was wrong until we moved on into the, the, um, the 60s. And people, things were starting to happen. In 1960, we had the Freedom Riders. And they, um, they rode, the Freedom Riders rode across the South, trying to get advantages for black folks to be able to ride the bus, public transportation. And then in 1955, it, well, I'll, I'll go back to 54, Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, Thurgood Marshall representing the NAACP saying, why do we have black schools and why do we have white schools? That's what I went to, an all black school. No race mixing was the, the tag, and so, um, I graduated in, in 65, and uh, it was still that way. It was ruled unconstitutional in 1954, 55, 56, but n nobody followed the laws. This is, this is the issue that people have with the legislation of these states. They can do whatever they want to do, and I can say that firsthand because I know about the Civil Rights Act, I know about the Voting Rights Act, and marching for people to have that advantage. Um, so then I'm going to even fast forward. Well, I wanted to say uh, some things about people who died. Because a lot of people, a lady walked up to my door the other day, a friend that I've known for 40 years, and, and when George Floyd died, and she said, I had no idea. And I said, where you been? Under a rock? Uh, but in the 60s, when Dr. King delivered that infamous I Have a Dream speech, uh, that was August 28th, 1963. September 1963, those four little black girls were bombed at, at 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. November 1963, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. People have been dying for the right to be free and for the right for us to have some of these liberties. And people seem to forget. How could, you know, it's like my four and no more. If it didn't happen to me and in my neighborhood, I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. But I think we're in a time right now where it can no longer be. If you choose not to get involved, or choose not to look, or choose not to see that people are dying to live. I have young black men coming to me saying, I don't want to die today. What, are, what, are, what am I going to tell them? I just say, well, you just have to keep, keep living. Been working with uh, Michael Daugherty on you know, exactly what kids are doing. It's unfortunate that the conversations that I have to have with my children and my grandchildren are so different than the conversations that all of you get to have with your own children. You know, and, and, and I'm particularly, you know, jumpy because of Ronnie Settles. He said to his dad that morning, his dad was shaving, and uh, and he was standing next to him, and he says, Dad, this is going to be my year. He was a senior. He was thinking of going to play for the Dallas Cowboys, and he was excited. And then, two hours later, he's, he's dead. This, this is, this is heart-wrenching for some of us. You know, some of us aren't fazed by it and not touched by it. And, 
you know, we got to move on, I know. But this is, these are conversations, and not just conversations, but actions, things we got to do. And I applaud you for taking the helm, and you've got to clone yourself <laughs> and mentor some other people and start consulting and telling them about these little, how hard is it to walk a neighborhood with a, with a Latino man on a Sunday afternoon? I'm sure people enjoy that. The trust is gone. The trust in this system, it isn't working. It isn't working, certainly not for, for my people. And so we got to figure out what we can do. So anyhow, I, I shared that, um, 63, and then 65 was the, the riots began. People say, those people are tearing up their cities. Those weren't our cities. Just know that. <laughs> they owned nothing there. But, um, and it's not a good thing. It's not a thing that we glory in. But <clears throat> Dr. King said, the riots are the voices of the unheard. People are not being heard, and so they, they're like, okay, I, here, take this. So I, I went on through the 60s. Oh, then in 1966, I went, I was at uh, HBCU, Historically Black College and University, and then my parents said, we don't have any more, more money to, to keep you at Lane College. You've got to transfer to Memphis State because they're taking coloreds there now. Oh, so I go to this university, 40,000 white students and about 40 of us. <laughs> and they let it be known that they did not want us there. But I was there from 66 to 68. Dr. King um, came to Memphis once again in support of garbage workers. One thing I know about Dr. King is when people died, he showed up. He kept saying he wasn't coming, he would not be in Memphis, and no, 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 I got many other things at hand. But when two men, Robert, Robert Walker and Echo Cole, 30 and 36 years of age, and I call their names because I don't ever want to forget those people who paid the price for the freedoms that we enjoy as well. They climbed it, they couldn't, went, couldn't take breaks, didn't have set working hours, they worked 16 and 18 hours a day, they, they ran three and four generation households. Um, and so I remember this like it was yesterday, it was cold and sleety, icy, rainy in March. Um, well, actually in February is when they died. Uh, and so they climbed in the back of a garbage truck to get warm and dry. And someone tripped the switch on the back of the garbage truck, and they ground up with the garbage. This is, you know, I mean, this is not just everyday kind of stuff. People died, and here we are talking about freedom. And I continually say freedom is not free. So anyhow, fast forward with that, 68, and that's February 68, March 68. I am in that March with the I am a man signs. And then on April 3rd, you all know the night of April 3rd, Dr. King came to Memphis on behalf of the garbage strike uh, and delivered his infamous, I've been to the mountaintop speech. The next day, uh, we are in, well, I was in class, still sleety, snowy, rain, I mean rainy, cold. If you know anything about southern cold, it's bone chilling cold. And so we came in from across the, uh, from the student center across the street. I lived in Minders Hall. And the, all the girls in the dorm were uh, uh, circled around the television. They would not allow us to watch TV. But that night they said, y'all can have the TV. <laughs> we were like, oh, TV, what? What's going on? And they said, Martin Luther King has been killed. And they started running up and down those halls, cheering and screaming and shouting to the top of their lungs that he got exactly what he deserved. 
and he was nothing but a commie and a troublemaker and a this and that. What do you think we felt? I, I, I was pretty devastated. I was angry. I, was, I, I wanted to hurt somebody. I was hateful, I want to say, but my heart has never really been hateful. But um, I had, that was a process. I had to go through quite a process to fix myself, if you will, or, or find out what, uh, what I can do to take all of this negative and all of this hatred and turn it into something positive. And so it was at that point. Well, it took me a few years. So 68, I left at the end of that semester. I left Memphis, I left all of that. I, I really could not deal with it. And I moved to Long Beach, California, where my sister and her family were. And then I, I w worked for 53, at Long Beach State, 53 psychologists and three psychiatrists. <laughs> and they all wanted to fix me. <laughs> and they were all white, mostly male, three ladies. They all wanted to fix me, but we, we, we all in that process taught each other a whole bunch of things about human nature and about life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. I haven't, I don't know that I've arrived there as yet. But anyhow, it was in that period that I had a chance to program myself because I had the wrong view of things. I always thought that I could help somebody and fix somebody and do whatever. But really, the fixing is in you. And if you're fixed, then you just join hands with that brother. I think I quoted to you all the other day, no man is an island. No man stands alone. Each man's joy is joy to me. Each man's grief is my own. We need one another. So I will defend each man as my brother, each man as my friend. And so I began from there to establish some friends and uh, relationships and all, all, with all kinds of people. We can't limit ourselves to our own ethnicity. This world is so much bigger than that. And I so do know that I value people. And if there's, um, and I'm constantly praying every day, if there's any wicked way in me, you know, help me, fix me. I want to be productive. I want to be an agent of change, an agent of reconciliation. I want to extend the olive branch across the, across the chair. I want to do whatever I can do. When I leave this planet, I want people to know that I cared. I better stop there. <laughs> You both touched a little bit on moving forward. And so we are at a place right now in this community that is really needing some guidance or perhaps a call to action. There are those of us that are trying to learn, trying to listen, and also want to know what can we do? How can I take my lack of knowledge and use it in a good way? What would you say to that? So I, I have, a, have a number of things that, uh, <clears throat> that, that I want to recommend. I am, I think I mentioned that I'm a part of the um, age-old National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, NAACP. Well, Boulder County has an NAACP chapter. And most people say, oh, black people are getting together. We have 400 members. We make up 1% of the Longmont, Boulder County population. I mean, not that many. So guess, guess what our members are? <laughs> they look like you guys. And we're doing great work, incredible work. We are, we are, we're working on the police reform with Boulder, well, well, city of Boulder. You know that uh, the Zade Atkinson situation where this young man was out in his Yard. He was a student at Naropa University, and he had a um, trash clicker. And he was stopped, 
uh, had a gun drawn because they, he was instructed to get on his knees. And he's like, what? I didn't do anything. And, and within seconds, six officers were around him with their guns pointed at his head. And as I expressed to him the difference between Ron Settles and him and you is that you're alive to talk about it. Ron is no longer alive. And so, and so the community has rushed to uh, solve the problem. But I, I know you've heard a lot of negative stuff from me today, but I'm all about being a solution provider. And so I'm always coming to the table to say, what can we do? What can we do to do something? And that's the first advice, do something. You know, people say to me, I don't know what to do. Well, call, call somebody. Call the, the mayor. Call city council. Sign up for those meetings every Tuesday night. Write your congressperson, your, your senator, your, your representative. Everybody can do that. You can make a call to the NAACP, but I, I would rather say join them. It's $30 a year. And we work by committees. And we've gotten incredible work done. And we were only three years old, two, two, two or three years old, maybe three. I'm on the executive committee, so we have a meeting immediately after this one. But do something. You know, extend that olive branch. Meet another person of color. You know, my door is always open. Y'all can always, always call me. And then it, we can donate to causes, to organizations. Maybe you can't be there, physically be there, but you certainly can donate to a, a, an organization that's advancing the cause of justice and and freedom, we didn't even talk about justice. Um, Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Well, guess what? Our, just like everybody benefited from the Civil Rights Movement and the Voting Rights Act, our justice is being threatened right now. And if we don't do something, uh, I don't know where we will end up. And then for me, you know, I'm, I'm in my 70s. And so I don't worry about myself that much, but I've got children and grandchildren that are coming up. What are we going to leave them? I don't want, I want to leave this place way better than I found it, but I don't know that I can do that. But in, in another case in point is they don't even know this history. That's the sad thing. My, my kids were, the twins, were at a daycare, and they got shoved down to the ground by the director. I'm just finding this out, and I'm saying, what? You know, kids can't really get the story right, and they're trying to explain it to me, and they were crying. And they don't know why. They don't know that it's because of the color of their skin, but it, it happens. It still happens, and so, Educate, we gotta educate ourselves. Educate ourselves to the laws, educate ourselves as to what, what is going on. Uh, say something and do something. Am I running out of time? Oh, okay, I can still keep talking. Okay. Um, so the big thing now, some of you may have heard, some of you may have not, is how to be an anti-racist. You know, it's racist and anti-racist, and most people don't even know the definition of either. But I do, um, I do, there is a book called, by that, and it's the number one bestseller right now. Uh, yeah, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. That's, um, so, and then I know that tomorrow night, or no, Wednesday, I'm going to be with the Longmont LAD, Longmont Area Democrats, and talking about um, reform and all of that. And actually, yeah, that's another whole subject, and I know Mike can address that. But to talk about uh, uh, police, everybody's talking about defunding. Let's just defund the, 
the uh, police departments. I don't think that that's what they mean at all. They couldn't mean that. They just shut down the police department. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters? I mean, <laughs> no. So that's not what, we're, what they're talking about. But I think what they're talking about is, um, um, you use the word, re-something. Repositioning, recalibrating, resetting. Uh, come back to that place of protecting and serving. You know, become that um, person that I can say, hey, Mike. I, you know, I trust you, and I, and I believe in you. Not that you're going to, you know, come in, in my neighborhood and tear it down or, or anything like that or kill up everybody in the house. Uh, so that's, that's just some things. I, I have more, and I think I said, I don't know if I shared this with you all or not, but I'm also on the Longmont Multicultural Action Committee, and um, they... Uh, their motto, we believe in the people of Longmont working together to be a caring and inclusive community, proud to embrace, respect, and celebrate each other. And so they've come out with their position statement. It's simple. NAACP has a great position statement that, you know, here's, here's what we're doing. We're standing in solidarity. I'm with you. You're with me. This is a community. Come, you and me, together. <laughs> That's excellent. That's what I say. excellent. Thank you. Mike, do you have anything you would like to add regarding that call to action? So I really agree with what Glenn has said around do something. There's lots of things that people can do in our community. Um, unfortunately, we're in a time of COVID-19. Oh. Oh, and... <laughs> And you know, part of the solution here is gatherings. Part of the solution is coming together. Part of the solution is getting to know your neighbor. Part of the solution is developing strong neighborhoods. Part of the solution is working in organizations like the Longmont Community Justice Partnership, like over 20,000 people have in this community in terms of bringing community-based justice to our community. Not, just, not justice from the criminal justice system, but community-based justice. We could enlarge that by two or three times in this community and really make a huge difference in people's lives and in the safety of this community. So I guess I'm, this is kind of post-COVID kinds of ways of thinking about things and in terms of, of what to do, but strengthen your neighborhood, get to know your neighbor. Um, there are neighborhood group leaders association that you can get involved with. Um, become more engaged with your community in some form, some way, or some fashion. Uh, by the way, um, you know, our police officers walk neighborhoods as well. And, and, and so it's not just that I walk the neighborhood with Dan Benavides. Our police officers also walk them. And they don't walk in the neighborhoods when there's a call or when they're looking for information or trying to look at a crime scene. They're in these neighborhoods now. Uh, as carved out of their time, of the work they normally do to try to get to know the people and try to get people, get people to know them. And so I just wanted to make that point very clear that that's happening and will continue to happen. I think last year our police officers walked close to 800 neighborhoods, if I, if I recall. And so, it's, so we're out there and we want to be known and, and we want to personalize who we are and we want uh, people to engage with us as well. But we also know now is a difficult time, um, whether it's the issue of racism, whether it's the issue of trust, whether it's the issue of a health disease called COVID-19. Uh, we're in these difficult times, but I, I think we're going to get beyond them hopefully sooner than later, and, and this kind of gathering and coming together is so critical. And I am totally convinced. I mean, people talk about the size of police departments in this country and, and how big they are. And, and, and one of the things I think we could do, I mean, sometimes there's this gap between what the community believes it needs and what, what the size of the police department is in terms of needing police services. And oftentimes people believe we should fill that gap with more police officers. Well, we haven't taken that tack in terms of trying to fill that kind of social gap. Our, our, our whole um, 
emphasis has been you need to somehow, the communities, the neighborhoods, the people, the families need to figure out how to fill those gaps. And, and so Glenda said it so well in terms of what that could look like. So I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you to both of you for setting examples for all of us on how to be more civic-minded and more inclusive whenever we can be. At this point, we'd like to turn to Macy to ask some questions that have come into us um, from the community, from the viewers, etc. cetera. Um, Macy's with Longmont Leader, and she will ask those. Thank you guys so much for being here, by the way. I didn't get a chance to say so. Um, so we have active uh, qu questions from our audience here. And um, one of the most, they get to vote on what's kind of important to them. So one of the biggest questions right now is, how do you train police to de-escalate potentially violent incidents? So there is there are protocols and specific training for de-escalation. But I want to back that one up a little bit and talk about who you need to have as police officers. Mm -hmm. What should be their personal attributes to become yeah. a police officer? Yes. You know, I, I won't dwell too much on current state legislation, but it missed an opportunity to discuss hiring profiles uh, and what attributes we should be hiring to become police officers. And so, of course, we're going to run across circumstances where there is violence involved. We, that happens. Uh, but what we want to be able to do is have people who know that there are other ways to um, solve and resolve and de-escalate those circumstances without using violence themselves. And so we've trained our, we hire people um, who can do that. We don't hire anybody who has an ounce of violence in their background. We just don't. We hire people who are more inclined to become, to, be, to get engaged in relationships. We want to hire people who want to connect, who want to relate, who want to have a sense of service. And, and so there's a lot more to that profile that we use, but that's critically important. So that when they do encounter a set of circumstances um, that's violent, that they're going to rely more on their own verbal skills, their, their own emotional intelligence, their sense of being able to connect and relate and to work with people in a way that can calm people down without having to use force. And that happens a lot in our community. It happens a, a, an awful lot. And so, however, given circumstances uh, that, where that may not be happening, and we do have techniques uh, that we use with people that are non-force related in terms of sometimes we just back off. We have been involved in circumstances where people have been angry, they've been, they've been verbally violent, emotionally violent uh, with somebody else uh, or with a neighbor or with us. And sometimes the best thing for us to do is just to back off. And, and not be, not necessarily be in their presence and give them time to kind of decompress, if you will, uh, the circumstances they're in. And so we, are, we, we train that, we train that. And so we, we use a lot of verbal skills, we use a lot of emotional intelligence, our, the capacity of our emotional intelligence. We don't necessarily want to force anything. If the situation is calm, uh, one of the things we make clear to our officers is we keep it calm. And, and so we do not want to take any set of circumstances that's calm and settled and stable and make it something different. The other thing, the phrase I use sometimes is sometimes people will get in police officers, they'll get in a personal space and they'll say things to police officers and they'll threaten police officers and they'll sometimes threaten to hurt police officers. And what we expect out of our police officers in Longmont is that they won't react to that. That they'll do what they need to do to calm themselves and to respond in a way that you can turn away potential wrath with quietness and soft answers. And so, in essence, that's we do a lot of what I just talked about. Um, so the next question, that last question was from Bill Ellis, by the way, and the next question was posed by Carol Pransky, forgive me if I got that wrong, 
Um, what is the experience of people of color with police and in, in our community in Walmart? experiences to you, Glenda? Well, I'll just talk real quickly, and I, and I certainly want to hear what Glenda has to say, but, um, you know, our experience has been to really try to personalize who we are, and to really get to know people. And we believe, especially a Latino, Latino population comprises 30% of our community, and one of the, one of the attributes of our Latino community is that they truly value relationships. And, and so and sometimes we don't want to do business with anybody until we've established a relationship with them. And our Latino community definitely um, falls into that realm. And so, you know, I will also say some people want to know numbers and statistics. Well, our community is around 30% Latino. And in, in 2017, uh, when we, we did the data analysis here just a little while ago, about 31% of the people we either ticketed or arrested were Latino. In 2018, it was 30%. And in 2019, it was 29%. And so the ratio, even though we don't, we don't arrest or ticket near as much as a lot of other departments do our size um, per capita because of all the other things that we have going on. And by the way, the number of people that we refer to restorative justice at the Longmont Community Justice Partnership is around 30% Latino. And so we utilize all of these uh, alternative complemental, complementary services that we provide um, to everybody. Um, we don't care what color they are. We don't care what background, ethnicity, race they are. And our, the data, bears that out in terms of the, the, the numbers that we, we have collected over time. So, um, so our focus is relationship. Our focus is get to know as many people in our Latino community as possible. Like I said, Dan and I walk mostly, almost exclusively Latino neighborhoods from, I think it was like December of, November of 16 through, through 19. And, and so with the whole idea of getting people to feel less fear because of the ongoing conversations around, the national conversation around deportation. And so we wanted to make it very clear to people in our community that that wasn't a fear they needed to have with Longmont police. And so we, we took a lot of time, uh, not just me, but a lot of other people within the police department to really try to um, convince, encourage people that they didn't have anything to fear from us around that, and that we wanted them to be able to access us and to feel safe with us. And so, there's a lot more we've done, um, but you know, one of the things that we know with people of color, Latino people, uh, is that uh, one of the things we've learned. I will say this: is that you got to go where they're at. You got to go to their neighborhoods. You got to go to their homes. You got to go and meet them where they feel safest. And when Dan and I would walk these neighborhoods, it was great in terms of how we got invited into people's homes. We we, we saw their they showed us hobbies. They introduced us to friends. Sometimes they would give us food, or sometimes we would just be on their front lawn or their driveway. And I know some of you in this room that you all can't see walked with us and experienced that very same dynamic. Um, but you got to go to where people are at. Government just can't sit back in its offices and behind the doors of government and, and say, well, they'll come to us eventually and, they, and the people will come to us. You have to get into the neighborhoods and you got to meet people where they're at. I can't emphasize that enough. And so that's what we're doing. I, I will. I when I got the uh, invitation, I I kind of read over it, and uh, it says, "What's daily life like in Longmont for a black person?" Uh, my answer was, "It's good, good, <laughs> yet challenging at times." You know, I mean, I, my son was born here, <clears throat> and um, and so he grew up right here in this town. So he was a kid in this town. He was a teenager in this town and he was a young adult here too and <clears throat> things between him being a little boy 
and you know, teenager, uh, teenager, tween, or before that, <coughs> excuse me, and then a teenager, and then a young adult. He went away to college. Was okay. Um, he did get stopped by the police officers, uh, and it, it's it's so funny because. It depends on who you are, because he was a Longmont athlete. Football, basketball, track, all that. And so people knew him, but the ones who didn't know him made me nervous. I, I, I must say, you know, because when we got here in 80, and I think it was 82 that those two Latino young men were killed exactly right after my nephew, Ronnie. And so I thought, my God, where have you moved us to in this place, you know? Um, <clears throat> although he fared okay because uh, he knew um, Officer Ross, who was the school, school, resource the school officer. officer at uh, Longmont High, and uh, he knew somebody else. But the couple of times that he did get stopped that, that they didn't know him made me nervous. He called me and, uh, and when he was stopped, he, was, he went to KU, sorry to say, he's a rock talk Jayhawk. My daughter is a CU Buffalo, but uh, he was home for break and he got stopped on Ninth. I live on Ninth. On the west side, he was going east side, Ninth and Lashley, or something, and he was stopped. And within seconds, he called me and he said, "Mom, there, there are four cop cars. All right, they pulled up on the grass and, you know, around and surrounded him." That makes you nervous. It makes me nervous, based on what I went through with my nephew. So, he put the he said, "The officers are here," and I said, "What do they want?" And he said, "Well." They said, you, your tags have expired. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, they haven't expired. They're in the glove compartment. Sometimes I go a year without putting them on. In fact, a, a female officer stopped me two years ago and said, I said, why are you stopping me? And she goes, your, ta your tags expired um, three months ago. And I said, oh, no. He, she said, can I put them on? <laughs> and I said, please, be my guest. So. I was able to, anyhow, he was talking to the officer. I asked if I could talk to him, and um, things worked out. But I'm, I'm saying, why did it take three police cars to surround the car he was in? It, it, it just makes you nervous. I, it makes me nervous. He also was stopped. Now, he's a big guy. He has, he's 6'4 mm, or so, and he has friends. He's the shortest one, I'll just say, out of those four guys. So he was stopped on I-25 by, um, I guess, the North Glen police officers, and they had them get out of the car. First question is, why are you stopping me? They, they never really said, I don't, I don't know. Anyhow, he got out of the car, and... Um, the officer said, the more they peeled out, I think the tallest one was 6'8". So 6'4 to 6'8, four guys. And the officer said, I must just tell you this, and I, I'll be honest with you. You guys are scaring us right now. The two officers, and I'm thinking, y'all got the guns, you got the billy club, you got the handcuffs, what, what? And really, they had no reason to stop them. So that scares me. You know, I'm past that stage, he's almost 40, but again, like I said, I have grandchildren who are coming along, and one is male, black males. That makes me nervous. Uh, so, so we got it, something's got to be done. Some reform has to take place. We got to come to the table and talk like you've done and like you propose. Other cities have got to do that, other, other people have got to do that. So anyhow, sorry, that's a long answer to your no, big question. Great answer. Uh, some other folks are wondering, uh, you know, Mike, as you 
are about to retire at the end of this week. Bah humbug. What's next? I mean, it seems like the you know the culture has kind of been ingrained under your leadership and in the police department. What does that mean for the city? And then, like, how, how much further do they need to go, Glenda, to continue this conversation? Well, let me just say, this, these conversations aren't going to stop. Um, now, I said years ago when I first got this job that I could be here 20, 30 years, and the next person is going to come in, roll up their sleeves, and say, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do, and we're not done. And, and the other part of this is our community is not done yet. And um, a police department sometimes is only as good as the community it works in. And so I invite, even though I won't be around after a while, but I invite anybody in this community to become more engaged in, 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 in our police services. Um, help us develop policies and procedures. Become a part of the citizen review panel. Um, you know, walk our hallways, volunteer to do some work internally, get to know our police officers, but I, I, the, this department is in good hands and I can assure you that these conversations aren't going to stop. Uh, we have work to do, our community has work to do, and, and uh, it would behoove us all that we, we keep on going in this direction. So. That's it? Just keep going? Yeah. Okay. I know we are about to wrap up time. Do you mind if I email all of these wonderful questions from sure. these folks to you? And would you mind answering? And we'll make sure these folks get an answer to their questions. Thank you. Uh, sure. And then we have about three more minutes before we need to wrap up. Um, we need to do closing statements. I get to do closing statements at five minutes. Um, so one of the, I think one of the quick questions, Glenda, um, that I have here from Rose Gracie is, and actually I just moved it, okay, what is your recommendation for black citizens of Longmont to connect with others in, and she says, in our local black community? Okay, thank you for that question. It, it's a challenge because there is no community per se, no, no black community uh, per se, so it's hard to pinpoint where people are. We have done a few things to, to pull the community together. I'm at Second Baptist Church. It's 112 years old, and I'm the second woman uh, in the pulpit in those 112 years. I invite them to church, and I'm not saying that you have to join or you have to be a member there, but for the last 40 years, for me, that has been our community. And, uh, and I am actually the community liaison, so just, just give me the information and I'll connect. That's one of the things that I learned from my grandfather and my, I mean, my, yeah, my grandfather and my grandmother. Pulling people together, I can do that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to, if I could have her information or, um, if you'd like to send her, give her mine and have her contact me. I'm happy to put her in touch. We also have an organization, I just thought of that. It's called Families of Color. There's another thing that dynamic that's happening here in our midst, and that is mixed families. Not, not black, not white, not, you know, they're, they're all different ethnicities. And yet, it, it may be a white family that has adopted a black child, or it may be, uh, as in my, my case, my kids are Latino and, and African American. So, so mixed families is the new, the new thing that's happening, and they don't really have a place to, to uh, go. But families of color, I'll put them in touch with uh, Shakita Yarbrough, and, and uh, let that be known. We are at about time. There are several polls here. I thought I'd just run through that real fast. Um, we asked people, what level are you willing to be involved um, to change, um, to engage in change, solidarity, and to assist people with change in their lives? We had 16 votes asked, where do I sign up? Um, and then 10 votes said that they are a little involved, but no one voted that they were not involved at all. 
Um, and then our next question was, are you willing to volunteer in Longmont? And we gave cultivate.ngo as a place to volunteer. 21 votes said they are very much willing, and one vote said no. Um, we asked people how long you lived in Longmont. The majority of people have been here for 10 years or more. Um, we asked, you know, have you ever witnessed racial discrimination? And there are 20 people, or sorry, 19 votes that said they have and one vote that they never have. And then we asked how people educate yourself on racial issues. And um, one person said they talk to person, somebody, first-hand knowledge. Um, Two people voted that they volunteer for supportive organizations. Eight people voted to read books. And three people voted that they um, use discussion groups. So there's a little bit of feedback about what our, our community is saying in there. Um, as far as everybody else, like I said, we will work to get these questions to both Glenda and Mike. And they will get back to us with their answers because there's some there's a lot of amazing questions here we just did not have time for. And I'd like to thank everybody for being patient with us through these technical issues today. Um, everything um, has been recorded and will be up on Longmont Public Media uh, YouTube channel. And we will take <coughs> that feed and share it on the Longmont Leader. And I'm going to guess on the Longmont Chamber of Commerce's Facebook page. So that will reach many, many people that way. Uh, I assume you can probably find that on Walmart Public Media's Facebook page as well. Um, but if you have any other questions, feel free to send them to me at Macy at LongmontLeader.com, and that's M-A-C-I-E. Um, and I want to thank Linda and Mike for you know, being, having the courage to come sit with us today and to discuss some difficult topics, and we greatly appreciate you. And Liz, thank you for moderating and I'm going to thank Scott and Walmart Public Media for taking the time to help organize all of this and, <coughs> and the crew there at Walmart Leader who's behind the scenes helping out a little bit too. Um, anybody else have anything you want to wrap up with? Great. Well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And thank you all too. And I think we're finished.